Welcome to the next session of the Human Factors in Diving Conference. And I've got here Daryl Owen, who's going to talk about how human factors can help manage risks in a busy dive centre. Now, Daryl is a UTD technical instructor. He's a RAID instructor, trainer and examiner, an instructor for the human diver. He lives in the United Arab Emirates and owns dive centres in both the UAE and Oman that specialise in education, exploration and marine science photography and videography. Um, now his talk, as I said, the title's there, is about busy dive centers are always under pressure to keep to the schedule, uh, make the customers happy and meet financial goals. Those, those tensions that are always in the system. Doing all that while managing safety and minimizing risk is a daily challenge for the dive center management teams. And this presentation that Daryl's put together addresses how you can manage risks more effectively. So Daryl, over to you. Thanks, Gareth. So, um, as Gareth mentioned, uh, I've been uh, I've been working with human factors in various capacities for most of my career, um, and most recently, after spending a lot of time training with Gareth, I'm trying to implement it in our in our dive centre. Um, so, dive centre's name is Freestyle Divers, and we hang on, there we go. We're going to run through a little look at who we are, who Freestyle Divers is. Um, we will look at our working environment so you get a feel of uh, what we deal with every day. Um, then I'm going to take you through the goals that we've set and some of the objectives that we're chasing after. Um, a bit of a run around our working plan and what we've achieved to date and then a look at where we're going next. So just as a quick look at what we do. Gareth mentioned it in the intro. So we have sort of four main pillars that we look at. Education, so that's all the diving education. Human factors falls in there as well. Um, science, uh, most of that is marine biology, marine conservation, although we do do some um, marine archaeology as well. Um, exploration, the fun bit. And we also have a photo and video school. And then of course, equipment sales and, uh, and travel and stuff as well. So just to break it down um, very quickly, you know, on the education side, we do the full gamut of, uh, of diving training from uh, recreational first time beginners all the way through to, uh, to technical training. Um, we train instructors. Uh, we also train people in dive center management as well, uh, which is an interesting sideline for us. Um, exploration, uh, my favorite is Rex, but uh, we've been out hunting for new reefs recently. Um, and we're also doing quite a lot of work on mapping and surveys as well um, with a GUET. So where are we? Um, we are right at the top of the UAE uh, in Fujera for our UAE center, and then right at the very top of Musandam, which is part of uh, Oman uh, in Kassab. So I'm going to get into our working environment a bit because um, probably everyone on this call has been to a dive center at some point during the diving career. And, you know, you go along, you get on a boat, you um, go out for your dive, you come back, the equipment gets washed and put away, etc. And it all looks sort of fairly easy. Behind the scenes, there's a lot going on. Um, so I've tried to sort of break it out into uh, different areas here, but as you can see, it's quite a complex um, system with lots and lots of interlinks in it. Um, People-wise, we have people of lots of different cultures in terms of staff as well as, um, as customers uh, and, and very differing education levels as well. Um, we also have lots of different languages to deal with and with that, from a communication perspective comes the, well, we're all speaking English, but are we actually talking about the same thing? Um, health and well-being is obviously a big factor for our people as well within the dive center, um, both for our customers and our staff. And lastly, which is an interesting thing, um, we sort of tend as humans to, to say, well, something is normal. You know, that's what normal looks like. But what we've realized over time is that everybody seems to have a completely different picture of what normal really is. So that's been quite a, an interesting challenge for us. Um, you know, somebody from Europe might think uh, A is normal and somebody from Sri Lanka or the Philippines or whatever might look at the same problem and say, well, no, B is completely normal. We'll get into it. Um, customers, uh, again, very experienced uh, uh, levels of 
very differing levels of experience. And, you know, we have children who are just starting all the way through to uh, you know, technical divers who are trying to up their game. Um, we have very, um, have a lot of variability in terms of the predictability uh, and reliability of uh, our customers as well. Um, you know, one size doesn't fit all and they all behave very, very differently. So we have to make sure we've got processes that cope with that. Um, risk perception, again, we see sort of a very different way of looking at risk. Um, we have a lot of Russian customers, for example, they have a very different way of looking at risk to perhaps some of our European customers. Um, and lastly, willingness to comply. We are working in the Middle East and you know, some people um, are not really into following rules and stuff. Um, so that's another part of the uh, variables that we have to deal with. Um, as I mentioned, we um, run lots of different types of services, you know, the education, the uh, science uh, and whatnot. Um, within the education area, we actually teach for multiple agencies as well. Gareth mentioned UTD, uh, RAID, we teach PADI. Uh, we're also a GUE center. So we've got lots of different standards that we need to keep track of, um, according to which courses we're running, of course. Um, and we quite commonly have situations where somebody's learning to die, but at the same time, they're also learning how to build artificial reefs with our marine conservation uh, teams. So um, multidisciplinary training is quite common with this. And all of that means that we need quite a, um, an efficient way of coordinating all of the resources across the different teams to make sure you know, stuff gets done on time and uh, to the quality we want. Which brings me on to the drivers. Um, so I've, I've summarized the drivers that we work to. Um, quality is a big one for us. We've worked very hard over the last six years to build um, a reputation for doing things right um, and safely. We clearly have uh, a driver of profitability. It is a business and it needs to make money. Um, costs are part of profitability, but in a diving center, costs just seem to accumulate everywhere. Lots of equipment to maintain, um, you know, lots of uh, uh, various sort of um, legal compliance type things that we need to pay for as well, uh, which I'll get onto in a second. Um, coordination and efficiency. Uh, in terms of constraints, time is probably the biggest one. Um, we've got to get everything done in a day. We have four boats going out every day um, and, you know, lots and lots of people to sort of uh, shepherd into the right places at the right times. Um, we are in the Middle East, as I mentioned before. Uh, the climate and the weather is a massive constraint for us. I mean, we have six months of the year where the temperature is 40 degrees plus. Um, the sea temperature got to 34 degrees this uh, this year, so we had a bit of a coral bleaching event there. But um, you know that leads to some interesting um, additional issues um, around fatigue. You know, health of the workforce, making sure that um, you know people are okay and not getting dehydrated, etc. Um, communications, uh, and I'll keep touching on this all the way through the presentation. You know, with such a variety of nationalities working for us and also diving with us. Um, communication is something that we really need to focus on. Um, and lastly, technical maintenance, that's also a constraint. Um, we are an asset-based business. Um, we need regulators and BCDs and fins and masks and boats and all that sort of stuff, tanks. All of it needs to be maintained to make sure that it's uh, not going to fail, if at all possible. And then lastly, we've got the whole legal and compliance side. Um, we do operate here under Sharia, uh, Sharia law. Now, you know, if you're from a Western country, um, the, the, the legal system here is quite different. Um, to sort of make it sure, it really is sort of guilty until proven innocent. So if there is an incident or an accident, then the person whose name is on the trade license, which is me, uh, basically gets thrown in jail until uh, we can sort out what happened. So that's definitely an additional driver for me personally to make sure that things go well because uh, I don't really fancy spending any time in a, in a prison here. Um, we operate in a resort environment, a five-star hotel, and they of course have their own um, standards that we need to abide by. 
And then lastly, we've got lots of commercial legislation here, municipal legislation, national legislation, Coast Guard legislation, and they all need papers and stamps and uh, whatnot for us to be able to operate legally. So as you can see, this is quite a complex um, environment to manage. Um, now, I want to get into uh, talking about the, uh, the goals and objectives that we've set ourselves. Um, so, in a very simple way, what are we trying to achieve? Um, I think the first step, and we are, uh, we've achieved this at this point, is within our own staff, we want everybody to be aware of what Human Factors is um, through baseline trainings and workshops, uh, reading videos, etc., so that you know people start getting into the mindset. Um, from there, and I think we are pretty much there on this as well. Um, we want buy-in because it's one thing to hear about, you know, what human factors is. Oh, it sounds like a nice idea, but it's quite another thing to say that I am actually going to commit to it. And when you're in the diving industry, you know, a lot of it is kind of about lifestyle and everything and getting people to commit to a scientific project when, you know, their idea of fun is taking people out diving is not necessarily always the easiest thing in the world to do, but I think we've actually got there um, by making it fun. Um, the next step, and we, we've started with this, um, we've still got a lot of work to do here, um, is, is really detection of errors. Uh, we obviously spot some errors, but we're absolutely certain that there are a bunch that we haven't spotted. Um, and so, the very first part of this is trying to make sure that everybody understands that you're allowed to make an error. You know, if it was an honest human error where you just forgot something, didn't do something, didn't get something quite right, it's perfectly okay as long as we can talk about it and work out a better way of doing things so that the next time we make less errors or don't make the error at all. Um, and that's obviously... Uh, something that we need to capture in a systemic way. Once we have a decent body of data, um, then we move into the sort of process improvement uh, stage. And to be honest, I think there's going to be quite a lot of concurrent engineering here with detection of errors and improvement of processes that are happening sort of fairly, fairly simultaneously. Um, but the whole point here is that uh, we need to adjust processes to make them more efficient, um, to, to reduce errors, uh, help with communication wherever possible, uh, as well as teamwork. And, and the most important for me is, uh, is data-driven decision-making. You know, why are we doing something? Well, we're doing it because we've worked out and proved that it's the right thing to do. Um, and all of that leads to, hopefully, risk reduction. Now, we are working from a baseline and my goal is to uh, going forward is to uh, basically look at this every month and start to do some analysis of kind of efficiency versus risk because there is a trade-off um, we, we could spend a fortune trying to eliminate every possible risk but you know will it be a fun diving experience for people afterwards will it be efficient will we be able to do the volume we need to do within the time we have Probably not. So we need to make trade-offs and decisions around, um, you know, how much do we want to spend in terms of time, effort, money on risk reduction versus you know, what's the real level of risk that we're actually reducing. So the process that we're in for the uh, education and buy-in, so the, the dive centre uh, staff have been through the, uh, the two-day face-to-face uh, uh, course, the Human Factors in Diving course, um, and uh, they obviously died a few times in space simulations, but had a, 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 a huge amount of fun. I have to say that um, when I told them that they were going to spend two days in a classroom learning about human factors, uh, I, I think they they kind of walked into the classroom backwards, you know, with slumped shoulders, thinking, "Oh, this is going to be really, really horrible and boring and academic." At the end of the first day, uh, there were so many smiling faces and uh, the discussions in the evenings were fantastic and everyone was super keen to get back in the classroom the next morning. So that, that went very well. 
And that was obviously preceded with the Essentials online uh, training as well. We've been doing uh, some workshops and I've got a lot more uh, planned. Um, one of the things that I've worked out is that I can't run the same education for everybody in the dive center. For the um, kind of Western schools, uh, people running the standard courses, which obviously includes quite a lot of academic work, um, has proved to be pretty successful. Um, however, I've got um, extremely uh, skilled and, 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 and great boat captains, for example, but you know their schooling was uh, fairly limited. And if I put them in front of uh, PowerPoint slides for an hour and a half, they've tuned out after after five minutes. So I've had to find different ways to try to get the message across to these guys. And, you know, practical workshops, the very hands-on people seem to work quite well. Um, training videos, which, uh, you know, fairly short, so they can watch in their own time, ask questions about that, uh, um, has proved to be a, another strategy. Um, probably the most effective though is kind of live role play. And, um, you know, an example of that would be uh, a full-on emergency exercise where we've got boats out and we simulate uh, incidents and accidents and then we have to get people in via our emergency uh, emergency action plan. Those sorts of things work very well with the guys. Um, where we're moving towards, we, we haven't started this but we will soon, is um, I'm trying to get into more of a collaborative design mode where I've got everybody who's accountable for different areas of uh, you know, the business, it's, it's their job. Um, and what we're trying to do now is to sort of get people together in the same room to collaborate and design better ways of doing things um, and, and talk about handoffs between you know, different people and the chain of events. Um, and then feedback and debriefs are an extremely important part of the education and also for us to understand what we're doing right and you know, where we need to improve. So I talked about detection of errors. Um, I mean, any dive center, if, you, if you're even half running it right, you're going to see some errors. You know, the boat captain forgot to fill the, uh, the, the boat up with petrol. And, it, you know, it's a bit dodgy in terms of having got enough petrol to go out. You know, that's an obvious error. Um, a piece of equipment ceases to function on a dive. Uh, we see that. Um, you know, there are various things that go on in the dive center, which are pretty obvious to spot. And the key there is making sure that when the, these errors do happen or these failures happen, that we actually capture and record it properly. And, uh, you know, I've dived in, I don't know, tens, perhaps hundreds of dive centers over the year, over the years. And um, I think a lot of people just rely on the professionalism of their people um, to make sure that if a regulator stop working, then it gets put in the right pile to get fixed. The issue is that, you know, there are other people who are very, very um, conscientiously trying to keep everything cleaned up. And so they'll pick up the broken regulator, not realize it's broken and put it into the operational regulator pile. These sorts of things, um, you know, you've got to work hard to actually have a proper system to stop um, those types of multi-person errors happening. If I go from the bottom, um, the ones that we don't see, the ones that are below the water level, um, you know, we've got a bunch of undetected errors that go on every day. Um, it could be uh, very new divers that are making errors and they don't even realize it, um, you know, in the first few dives that they make after their courses. We're probably never going to get very far with that um, in terms of detection. Obviously, if we've got guides that are looking out for this. We may pick up a few, but it's not going to be... Uh, a substantial body of data, I suspect. Um, then we've got deliberate deviance, where people are cutting corners either because they don't want to follow the rules, they think it's clever not to, um, or because they've worked out a better way of doing their job, but it's just not the way that the work was designed. <laughs> so being able to spot that and then correct processes um, when it makes sense is, is important to us. Um, then we've got normalized deviance where people have been doing um, the right or the wrong thing, um, but not as, uh, as designed for a long time. Uh, and, you know, in a dive center in the, in the sort of tropical area, you do have quite a turnover of staff. We, we usually end up with two years and very often, you know, we'll have uh, people move on after the two years and now we've got the next people who move in. 
Well, what happens is that the people going out teach all of their habits to the people coming in and the people coming in take it, take it as gospel. You know, that is workers designed when in fact it was already deviating, but nobody realized. And then lastly, you know, we've got the human errors that happen every day, um, but that we don't see. So these ones, uh, this is much more of a cultural thing, and it's really making sure that all of our instructors, our dive masters, our boat captains, uh, all the guys that help make the, uh, the dive center run efficiently, that they're um, perfectly um, comfortable with actually reporting those things and saying, listen, you know, I, I, I screwed up today. Um, here's what happened. If I thought it through, then what I should have done was this. And that now becomes very useful information to us in terms of improving, you know, processes, behavior, whatever. Now, anyone who's done any sorts of studies with Gareth will know this, uh, this diagram. Uh, it's basically the different areas of training that we do within the human factors and diving system. And what I'm gonna do now is run you through each part of this and just explain what we are focusing on. So if I look at teamwork, good teamwork, the key areas for me here are efficient training. So technical, so diving skills or you know science skills or whatever those uh, might be. We need to focus on that, but also all the non-technical skills gaps, so the human factors uh, um, pieces. And obviously that's going to be specific for each role. And one of the key things that we're doing now is educating on the, uh, the briefing and debrief skills. Um, common team goals. Uh, I think we often assume that everybody actually has the same vision, but what I've realized over the last, uh, well, six, seven months of, of looking at this in more detail is that we thought everybody had the same goal, but when you dig into it, mm, not quite, there are variations. So we're working on that. Uh, clear communication, I've spoken about this several times, it is vital to good teamwork. Um, and lastly, managing stress. Uh, when you're running a busy dive center and it's the fourth boat of the day, and it might be your third dive of the day, uh, and it's 40 degrees outside and you've had customers that were quite demanding, you know, it can get pretty stressful. And the ability to rely on your teammates um, and be able to say, you know what, I really don't think I should do the third dive. I'm feeling dehydrated, lightheaded, you know, can you take it over for me, mate? Um, super important. Good leadership and followership. Um, well, everyone's a leader at some point. I mean, even the guy that's carrying the tanks down, uh, he's a leader um, when it comes to making sure that everyone's got the right tanks. So we are working on helping people to understand the right, um, the right leadership style for each, uh, each situation. And um, also we're trying to make sure that people are comfortable with speaking up. Now, that may sound a bit strange, but we have people from you know different Asian cultures, for example, that have very strongly ingrained uh, culture around authority gradients. And you know, if I have a conversation as owner of the dive center with someone, then they'll just nod and say yes, yes, boss, um, and might not tell me really important information. Um, so the whole sort of speak up and tell me when I'm wrong. Uh, tell me if I've missed something. That's really, really important to us. Um, okay, so uh, uh, apparently we had a little technical glitch, so uh, I'm going back in time. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to pick up again at uh, teamwork. We're not really sure where we uh, where we lost you, but uh, so teamwork. Um, you know, a key key part for us here is making sure that everybody. Uh, has the correct training for their roles. So, you know, this might be training from a technical perspective, so dive training or science training or exploration training uh, and whatnot, or the non-technical skills, so the, the human factor stuff that we're talking about here. And a key area for us uh, that we focused on early was the briefing and debriefing skills because, you know, those are important to us every day at the dive center. Uh, then common team goals. Um, uh, the, I thought, I thought we had a clear goal and then, uh, 
over the last few months, I've realized that everyone does have a clear goal. It's just that they're not necessarily all the same. Um, so <laughs> we're going to be working on uh, making sure that we have uh, some good confirmation that we're all working towards the, the, correct, the correct team goal. Um, I've mentioned several times in the presentation about clear communication. Uh, we've got so many languages, cultures, etc. cetera. Um, that one, uh, we're trying to introduce uh, you know, methods to help us, you know, things like uh, repeating stuff back, uh, rephrasing, et cetera. Um, it just needs lots and lots of practice. Uh, and then lastly, managing stress. We are operating uh, four boats a day, uh, in fact, multiple boats four times a day. Uh, we have you know, multiple dives to do a day, multiple different training classes, and it's, it's in 40 degrees in the summer, 40 degrees plus. So it's very, very easy, especially if you've had some difficult students or clients that particular day to get pretty stressed out. So. The ability to say, I can't, or I'd rather not do this the third dive today, I'm feeling dehydrated, my head's not in it, and then hand over to somebody else is uh, you know, a really nice thing to have, an important thing for us to have. And that's one thing that we do pretty well at the moment. Uh, so I'll just give you one second. So communications, we are trying first of all to uh, to, to reduce barriers. Um, you know, there's there's lots of different barriers to communication. You know, you're stressed out. Uh, you're trying to get too many things done in too short a time. Uh, you get interrupted or distracted. You know, that happens a lot with instructors while they're setting up uh, their equipment, and somebody comes over and says, "Where do I get my rig from?" Or you know, which way's the boat, and, and that kind of stuff. So. Finding ways to communicate uh, to uh, help to manage those sorts of things is very, very important to smooth running. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, we, we have people who are from cultures where speaking up uh, is, is something that's not comfortable for them. So creating an environment where they don't feel that there's going to be retribution or that uh, people uh, Know, treat them as stupid or something uh, it is important for them to be able to communicate uh, fully then structure so there are a couple of different techniques that we uh, we teach within human factors and diving the s bar and the pace models um, those are useful in you know, specific situations uh, the pace model particularly we had uh, a boat driver who's recently left to uh, go back to his country uh, a, a real character and we did some uh, we did some exercises in terms of uh, you know incidents and accidents at sea, and the radio traffic coming back from this guy was uh, I mean we should have recorded it because uh, there was supposed to be a grading of uh, importance to the the particular accidents, but basically everything went to uh, red for him, and uh, he, he was actually stressing himself out and speaking at uh, high speed. And so we had to uh, sort of cut that back and move into uh, something more along the pace uh, sort of line of thinking to, uh, to get that under control. Um, listening. Now, that's important at all levels and probably most important for me uh, to make sure that I'm understanding what's going on and what people are really saying. And it, it's so easy when you've got uh, constraints on time, you know, we're working to a schedule, etc. that when somebody says something to you, you kind of fall into a groove and you assume that what they just said to you is what they've said to you five times before. And in fact, they didn't. So, you know, I've had to be quite, uh, quite careful with my own listening and that. Um, situation awareness, this one, uh, in terms of setting out objectives was super, super difficult. Uh, it's probably the most difficult one to, uh, to plan, but we've actually made it probably one of our best performers at this point. Uh, and what we've done is we've worked through the theory of situation awareness at the level that people can absorb. So, um, some people were quite comfortable looking at, uh, at, at flowcharts and, and diagrams about uh, social 
about uh, situational awareness. You know, other people, we needed to give them far more practical and sort of simple examples for them to be able to understand it. Um, and then what we've done is we've done a lot of practice. So depending on what we're talking about, whether we're talking about, uh, you know, underwater or on the boat or in the dive center, we've sort of created uh, some, some life scenarios just to sort of help people to understand, you know, what they're noticing, not noticing, and mostly to understand when they've lost situational awareness. Uh, and I'm planning to do some, uh, some video uh, sessions, which I'll talk about in, uh, in a little while. Um, distractions. Again, we're trying to work on uh, creating uh, ways to avoid people or minimize people getting distracted, uh, as I mentioned before. So, you know, cue cards and stuff like that, standardized verbal or, or visual responses to people, you know, putting a hand up and saying, uh, just, just give me two minutes till I finish what I'm doing. Um, and lastly, teaching. So we have included situational awareness as a specific topic in our instructor courses and our dive master courses uh, above and below water to help people to understand uh, different scenarios. And, and it's worked pretty well. We've, we've done quite a lot of video work as well underwater so that people can understand uh, you know, where they missed things. Decision making. Um, so for very routine tasks, repetitive tasks every day, uh, we're really trying to work on embedding system one thinking there. Uh, so that, you know, in the same way that you don't think about moving from uh, first gear to second gear on a manual, uh, manual car shift, uh, you're not thinking necessarily uh, about how to do something. You're just doing it. It's very much like uh, you know stripping and reassembling a weapon in the military. Just do it lots of times, then do it blindfolded. Um, clone the experts. So we have been doing quite a lot of shadowing, um, particularly underwater. Uh, and a great example of this is we have a really, really skilled guide uh, he's been doing it for 30 years plus and how he read currents, reads currents, I have no idea, but he's, he's amazing at it. And so he's been doing a lot of, uh, sort of cloning work with, uh, with instructors and dive masters to help them to understand how to, uh, to make good decisions based on visual cues. Um, rules, we're using rule-based systems where they make sense. Uh, for example, the emergency action plan, we've put a plan together there, which has got uh, basically flowcharts and rules about what to do, depending on the, uh, uh, the, the accident or incident. And then checklists. Uh, we're doing quite a lot of work on checklists, and I'll talk about how we're doing some visual checklists as well. Um, stress and fatigue. We, as I mentioned before, have a very stressful and fatiguing environment, especially in the summer. So um, self-assessment and team assessment, anyone can call a dive. So we do actively sort of look out for each other. If you're on a boat and you start to see that you've got an instructor that really doesn't look quite, uh, quite there, you know, just boiling over or whatever, uh, dehydrated, we will actually have that discussion and say, listen, do you really want to go on with this? Because it looks like you probably shouldn't. Uh, and we've got to a point where people don't take that personally. Um, so we're also trying to look after the sort of physiological side of that as well. So making sure that people hydrate, making sure that we've got electrolytes in the water and so on and so forth. Uh, there's been, you know, a good thing to do. Uh, De-stressing in the evening. So, you know, everyone has their different ways of doing it, but, uh, you know, pretty much each evening, the team all sits down and has a good old chat about what went on during the day. Sometimes a laugh, sometimes a sob, but uh, yeah. And then, we are also including uh, specific parts uh, within the instructor and dive master training around this whole stress and fatigue thing because it's an environmental concern where, we, where we're working. And lastly, um, just culture and psychological safety. Um, this is obviously a longer term uh, objective for us. Um, trust is the most important thing to make this work in a dive center. And it's something that's quite hard, especially when you've got staff that are you know maybe only working for you for two years you, you've got to kind of create an environment where trust becomes natural uh, and that's not easy to be honest it's taken us a long time to get to that uh, 
judgment, reserving judgment until we've actually got the information we need to make a good judgment instead of just making snap decisions that are based on nothing. Uh, the whole counterfactual um, could have, should have, would have. Um, it's so easy to do, especially when you're a bit tired at the end of the day. Um, but we are making a conscious effort to try not to do that and to try and dig into it a bit to, uh, to work out why certain things happened and why the decisions were made. And then lastly, and uh, I've heard this in a couple of the presentations over the last, uh, the last day and a half, um, implementing just culture is, is not a license to get forgiven for whatever you did. Um, you know, it's not a sort of mere culpa with instant forgiveness. Uh, if there is destructive uh, behavior, then obviously it will be penalized. But, uh, you know, as long as we're very, very clear about what's good and what's not, then, you know, that seems to be not too much of a problem. Right. Working plan. Uh, I'll go through this quickly because I can see time's running on. So I, I mentioned that we've trained the instructors and managers. Um, we have done some training also with the boat captain support staff, but I'm creating uh, new types of training for those guys, which is far more practical and visual. Um, so we'll run that. We are just finishing updating our emergency action plan with new checklists and some redesigned operational guides that are a lot easier to use uh, in a stressful uh situation much more pictorial um we're also looking at redesigning the customer briefings and the boat briefings and uh i want to make these much more image rich as well uh, i think it's far easier for people to look at pictures uh to understand you know where currents might be or where danger areas might be on a particular site or where the boat's going to pick them up and where they are now much easier to see that on a picture so we're going to try and standardize that in with the safety briefings um, at the end of boat trips, we kind of do this informally, but I want to have a much more formal but efficient and doesn't take too long debrief on how the trip went. And it might be that it went superbly well, everything went absolutely to plan, fantastic, tick in the box. However, usually there's something that we could improve on or not do again. So we're going to try and capture that in a more formal way. Um, in addition to which, we also want to capture a debrief on anything that got broken or damaged or, you know, was missing. Um, I'm going to be working on um, integrating human factors into the RAID uh, instructor courses um, and the instructor updates, um, as well as into the diving courses. And I'll, I'll touch on that in the next steps. Um, and lastly, you know, weekly reviews of all processes from bookings right the way through to payment um, for efficiency and communications, then a monthly review, as I mentioned before, uh, just to look at where we are in terms of risk, culture, and, and psychological safety as well. Now, achievements to date. Uh, I do need to put up this little warning here. Um, so I'll give you a couple of seconds to read this because I'm going to provide a picture of where I think we've got to. And obviously there'll be some red crosses on it. So I just want to make, uh, make it clear that uh, we are still pretty safe, even if we haven't quite got to where we want to be with, uh, with, human, with human factors yet. So I've broken this down again into the, uh, the different areas, uh, development areas, so teamwork, followership, and leadership, communications, et al. And you'll see different columns here. So the first is a level of understanding. Do people actually get what those things are? and fully get it and you'll notice that i think we're probably there i think that there are pockets of people who still haven't quite grasped what good decision making is um then we've got individuals who've achieved it so in the main part um there's a slight inconsistency with decision making but i think in the main part the individuals have actually got to a point where they achieved um ownership and good understanding and a first level of execution in pretty much all of these. Uh, we've still got a way to go on the just culture psychological safety piece, but that's going to take time. Um, then we've got a column that says, well, if we formed uh, a sub team, so we put a group of people together for a particular project, how well does that work? Well, I think we've got good teamwork. That's, that's pretty good. Um, 
I think the followers, followership and leadership we still need to work on and the communications for all the reasons I've mentioned several times, that also needs to be uh, you know, improved as much as we can. Um, situation awareness, I think we're pretty good with that. Um, decision making, as I mentioned before, we've got some work to do and then uh, obviously the, the just culture and psychological safety is uh, ongoing. And the last column is kind of the nirvana, is where we get to consistent you know, team high performance. And I think the only one that we've really cracked at this point is, uh, is good situation awareness. Um, but you have to remember that we're setting the bar very high here, um, which is a good thing, but it's, uh, it's a long-term objective. So in summary, um, what we've learned so far is, well, firstly, it's not easy. Um, that there are lots of moving parts. And so we found that systems thinking has been quite valuable to us. Um, there isn't a cookie cutter answer. We're having to sort of reinvent this stuff every day and everyone's different and everyone learns at different speeds. Um, trust, without it, this thing couldn't get off, get off the ground. So I think we, uh, we've all recognized that that's a massively important part of this project. Um, and lastly, if in doubt, simplify. Um, I think it's very easy to get into um, a lot of academic thinking around this, but we can only implement that as far as people can understand the, uh, you know, the academic side of things. So for people who are not very academic, then we've had to find uh, you know, simplified ways of doing things because otherwise we end up with a weak link in the chain. Um, and obviously that's not what we want. Um, I think the things that we've learned not to do is don't force it. Um, I mean, firstly, you can't force people to trust you. In fact, if you try and force them, they'll do exactly the opposite. They won't trust you at all. So you've got to let it go at its own speed um, and then celebrate this is just motherhood and apple pie here, but um, you know, don't hide successes, however small they are, because what we're really trying to build is not just a set of processes. We're trying to build a mental attitude. Um, don't set yourself up for failure. The temptation you get so excited by all this stuff that you let you, you start working on five different projects at the same time and then they all kind of don't work so we've learned that setting yourself realistic goals and being prepared for delays is is a wise thing uh, especially in the middle east where unfortunately delays do happen fairly regularly and then lastly um, don't give in i mean sometimes it seems like you're banging your head against the wall to get people to understand what uh, what you'd like to happen and it does actually work. If you just keep at it, keep repeating it, attacking it from different angles, uh, there will be a kind of aha moment where the team tunes in, gets it, and it's like, oh, that's what you were talking about. I, I didn't realize this is easy. And that's the, the, the fun part. And then next steps, before I close, um, we've got a long and exciting journey ahead. Um, integration of human factors, into the RAID education system. I'm leading that project and we're going to be putting uh, you know, a, a subset of Gareth's so, work in the education yeah, system. I, we need to just quickly wrap this one, Daryl, and then we can move into questions because we're yep. a little bit longer um, than we are. Going to be working on the interactive video training. Um, if anyone's interested, we can talk about that afterwards and obviously carrying on with the roadmap. So thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Daryl. I know we had a little bit of a glitch and you've got some extra time to catch up on that. So uh, thank you for, for this. Um, anybody who has got any questions, because I would have thought that this actually is quite an important thing. You know, we have dive centers out there. It's the mainstay of how education gets out to the diving community. If you've got a question, uh, can you go into the I have a question table? Um, I've got a question, um, which is what benefits have you seen from the work you've done so far? Because people won't do anything unless they can see a benefit. So what, what's the benefits you've seen? Um, I think probably the most important one that I've seen is um, a strong desire for teamwork within the team. Now, that that has really accelerated since we've done the, uh, the human factors work. Um, you know, before we had lots of very busy people who were running around doing what they were supposed to be doing, not necessarily thinking about what everybody else needed to be doing. And that has improved dramatically. Um, and I would say that, uh, you know, we've done really well on the situational awareness side, as I, I sort of mentioned, uh, that that's come along a leaps and bounds since we started doing this as well. And there are probably 
you know, lots and lots of other things. But ultimately, you know, our risk is being reduced. I mean, we can measure it. That is excellent. Uh, and that's, you know, a lot of the diving industry, a lot of the diving game, especially when you're in the professional environment, is about risk or uncertainty management. Um, trying to make it, you know, a, a really enjoyable session for the, the divers, make sure your staff feel well, you know, worthwhile, and, and actually you're helping them achieve good outcomes. Um, and, and that ends up with, with fewer accidents or near misses. Uh, and actually the ability to talk about those, which is, is crucial. So if anybody else has got any questions, Daryl will be in the lobby in Meet the Speaker Hall 1 uh, from now. Um, and then on the top of the hour, we've got Jenny Lord, who's going to talk about actually the, the topic that Daryl said has had the greatest impact on his dive centre, which was all about how to assess and develop situation awareness in others. And I would say it's probably one of the hardest things, as, as you alluded to, Daryl, because situation awareness is developed in somebody else's head. Um, and, and that means you've got to have a feedback loop of some form to say, what did you understand from this and, and what's going to go forward? So Daryl, thanks very much for this. And uh, we'll see everybody else on the top of the hour. Thanks.